בשם השם נעשה ונצליח, שיעור תורה, ברוכים הבאים. We're back to our Tuesday night שיעור, we're continuing a series on the Geret Agrad, the letter by the Gaon Mivilna to his family, and the very famous letter, and בעזרת השם, each and every single verse in it, or sentence in it, is a limud in itself, a learning in itself. Tonight's שיעור Uh, will be for Ilui uh, Nishmat Chanoch Ben Avraham and also Ilui Nishmat Rachamim Ben Agababa and Lehavdil uh, for a Refua um, Shlema for Orit Bat Ilana Rabbanit Sara Bat Anat Rabbanit Levana Bat Sara Rav Efraim Ben Shulamit David Ben Esriya Doris Bat Jora Joshua Ben Noach um, Itro Ben Avraham, Talia Bat Sara, and also for a Atzlacha Rabba for Marsha Bat Julie, Ayla Bat Marsha, Samuel Ben Marsha, Sefas Ben Marsha, Alexander Ben Marsha, Louis Ben Marsha, Shaul Ben Farzane, Oshri Ben Doris, Gabi Ben Doris, Elad Ben Doris, David Ben Esriya, Itro Ben Avraham, Netanel Yosef Ben Avraham, And Ruven Chaim Ben Pala Parel. הקדוש ברוך הוא יברך אותם בכל מכל כל, חיים ארוכים, שלמים, מלאים תורה, מצוות וגמילות חסדים. To them and to all the wonderful people that uh, continue to help us do all the great things that we're doing, ברוך השם. Uh, for anyone that follows the channel uh, closely, you uh, probably uh, have been wiping your tears for the last uh, hour or so, or two hours. Uh, since the uh, clip of uh, our uh, dear friend Rav uh, Mordechai Sharf uh, was uh, published, uh, simply telling you uh, the, uh, not only the troubles that he's dealing with now, but uh, what he's been dealing with for uh, the best of uh, 15 years now. And uh, anyone that hasn't watched it and uh, wants to uh, feel uh, a little bit of pain uh, of another Jew, Uh, please do watch it uh, after the Shiur Bezot Hashem. Uh, and this is, uh, again, one of many cases that our organization, Baruch Hashem, uh, continues to deal with, continues to uh, try to do whatever we can to help them. Uh, we're trying to, in this particular case, we already uh, uh, started a, uh, a fund where we're, we're giving him money weekly so they have food to eat for Shabbat. Uh, we made the commitment and we've already been doing it for, for uh, the last several weeks. You know, we've been helping him during the holidays, but now we see that the situation since his recent accident, work accident, uh, where he lost uh, a couple of fingers uh, about two months ago, um, uh, made him lose a job. So the situation got worse. So he's now uh, one of the people that we're helping on a weekly basis. Uh, but also we have to uh, raise some money so we could help his, uh, his daughter. Uh, get married and uh, for those of you that want to uh, contribute to that please do uh, you know we're looking uh, to raise for this specific case uh, uh, you know around ten thousand dollars or so should be more than enough uh, to have a modest but uh, respectable wedding uh, you know with these are not uh, people that are looking to have uh, uh, you know a uh, a wedding uh, with uh, famous singers that uh, themselves cost fifty a hundred thousand dollars or uh, to have a uh, 17-course meal and uh, somebody show up with a, uh, you know, a Harley Davidson in the middle. Uh, you know, they're looking for a modest kosher wedding that, of course, is not going to be missing anything, but nonetheless uh, is not going to be anywhere near the craziness that uh, you sometimes uh, see online. People are, have uh, these, uh, you know, wedding campaigns and they're looking for the public to give them, you know, $50,000, $100,000 so they can get married. I mean, it's, uh, I find... Uh, Uh, request like that absurd but unfortunately uh, you know it's a uh, people don't really uh, know uh, what's the right place to give some time what's the wrong place to give uh, so here we, you know with this uh, person with the uh, we know him personally we uh, uh, have spoken to him have helped him quite a few times over the years but uh, here we see that uh, there's uh, Hashem wants to continue using us as the vessel to help his children and for those of you that want to partner with us you're more than welcome to Uh, and of course, there's other cases. There's uh, plenty of cases that are uh, similar to this. Sometimes it's weddings. Like I said, sometimes it's surgeries. Hashem Alechem. Sometimes it's a, uh, uh, you know, just outright poverty, which is uh, the most common. 
Uh, and you know, there's a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of help is needed out there, and uh, we're trying to do whatever we can. We're trying to do Baruch Hashem whatever we can, and Hakadosh Baruch Hu is uh, making that work. Hello, hi everyone. We're about to start a new week, a new week of wars. Not only the wars against the bad people, but also wars to continue helping the good people. As many of you know, uh, some of the things that we do behind the scenes as part of our organization, Bezal Hashem, is chesed, to help the good people, help the people that HaKadosh Baruch Hu sent our way to help them and uh, do ourselves the favor of being the hand that uh, feeds them, being the hand that uh, pays for the doctor for an emergency surgery, or to uh, help somebody uh, pay the electric bill, all types of other needs. There are many, many projects that continue to come our way, and uh, many of them are extraordinary people that we know, we know personally, that uh, we verify, we have somebody who knows them, and uh, Baruch Hashem, the stories continue to come in. Now you're going to hear also a recording from a, a fantastic, extraordinary person that you've probably heard his voice before in uh, some of our other recordings, first mainly Mordechai Shaf. He's an extraordinary person with an enormous amount of Isulim and suffering in his life. Countless surgeries, different parts of his body, lost his ability to hear in, uh, in one ear and uh, seeing one eye. His family doesn't even know about the ear. But uh, this is something that we just got uh, a few days ago and he's telling us so with much tears. Uh, his wife uh, had uh, some type of issue where she uh, lost her ability to speak in a... Uh, you know, in the normal way she always did her whole life and uh, from embarrassment they had to move uh, to a different neighborhood because she was so embarrassed of herself. Uh, and if that wasn't enough, recently in his uh, job he cut off uh, in an accident two fingers, Shemi Shmovetzi, just just uh, in, in an accident that unfortunately is unfixable. So there are many people like this that reach out to us and we try to do the best that we can to help them. Right now Mordechai needs help to marry off his daughter. His daughter is an extraordinary person that herself is a Baalat Chesed. She helps a lot of people. She uh, every day takes care of two uh, special needs children. And uh, surely she's a uh, person that we want to, to help. If you would like to be our partner in this project to help marry off her, his daughter or many other projects, please open up your hearts, open up your pocketbooks and make sure to be generous because there are many, many people they can use our help, and as we all know, the time of Mashiach is here, and there are two things that will save each one of us, Torah and Bilut Chassidim. Torah, we have to all keep Shabbat, we have to all keep mitzvot, there's no question about it. But the same token, we also have to have Chesed. And Chesed includes helping people do Tshuva, doing Kiruv, as well as helping people that HaKadosh Baruch Hu sends your way, sends your way for you to help them one way or another. Please, be generous, and... Make sure that you're a partner with good people for good things. B'chavaz l'chav to each one of you, and we'll talk very soon. Kol tov. Omnom asha mo'od mo'ukheret, v'shtayim b'alay lo'od ma'ad. Aval ma' na'ase? Ha'kev hu gadol. Ani rotze l'fnot elechem. Rabbanim chashuvim yodim mekarim. Ani kuli ro'ed mitrakshut. Od chotshayim pachot. אנחנו ניגש לקודש ברוך הוא, כשארון הקודש יהיה פתוח, ונגיד לו, קולי, שמע, וראה, דמע, עיני, במילים האלו, אני פונה אליכם, יהודים יקרים. קולי, ולא רק קולי, כל אשתי, וכל הבחורה החשובה, שמעו, לא רק שמעו, הבינו. ואני לא יכול להגיד לכם הוא רואה דמה, כי רק קודש ברוך הוא רואה, אבל תאמינו לי, הדמעות לא נגמרות. כמו שדוד המלך אומר בתהילים, בדמעתי ארסי אמסה, מסבירים המפרשים, שאני מלכלך את הכלי מיטה שלי בדמעות הנגרות מעיניי ללא סוף. אתם ודאי תשאלו מה השולחן הזה. אני לצערי הרב עברתי המון 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 בחיים. אני כבר 15 שנה שאני נמצא בבתי חולים, אשפוזים, ניתוחים, בלי סוף. ובכוח הרצון והתפילה אני עדיין שורד. על כולנה 
קרה מקרה לפני פחות מחודש, שנקטעו לי שתי אצבעות, חלק גדול מהידיים שלי, והנה, תראו, פשוט נקטעו לי. ייסורים, כאבים, מכאובים, עצרו לי את החיים, הפסדתי את העבודה כרגע, אבל עוד פחות מחודשיים וחצי יש לי בת, והיא הולכת להגיע בעזרת השם לחתונה. אנחנו צריכים לעשות הכל, ואני מבקש מכם, תעשו הכל, שהיא תגיע בלי בושה, שלא תתבייש מהחברות שלה. לא נעים לי להגיד, אני לא אוהב לחשוף דברים מהמשפחה. לצערי בפעם אחת מהלידות אשתי איבדה את הדיבור והתחילה לגמגם מאוד. אבל כל התמודדויות קשות. אני יכול לראות לי מסמך מהירור רפואה וחיים, ואני מראה לכם את זה, איך שפה רשום בפנים שחיתנתי לפני שנתיים שתי ילדים, שתי מחינוך מיוחד, זה גם לא בא כל כך קל. זה גם קשה. והנה אני אציג לכם חלק קטן מהמסמכים. הנה זה ממד"א, זה ניתוח, זה סיכום ניתוח, זה הפניה לעוד בדיקה, עוד הפניה ועוד הפניה. זה התעודת זהות עם כל הילדים שלי. פה זה מכתב שחרור של ניתוח מלפני כמה שנים. פה זה עוד ניתוח. פה זה סיכום מה... שאני צריך עכשיו לעשות על כף היד. פה יש לכם הסכמות מרבנים גדולים בדין צדק. פה יש לכם בדין צדק השליח בדין, כתב לי מכתב. קחו דוגמה רק שיניים, מה שהיה לי בשנים האחרונות. הנה, 15,000, 7,000, 6,000, 6,000, בלי סוף. תרופות, הכל מלא תרופות, כל שעתיים סוכר, כל ארבע שעות לחץ דם, ככה זה נמצא פה על השולחן כל היום. כתוב הרי הרופא השם לנשברי לב, ולכל הדברים האלו השם נותן שליחים, כמו שאנחנו אומרים מכאן שניתנה רשות לרופא לרפא. אז גם פה אותו דבר, בבקשה, אני מתחנן בפניכם. תהיו אתם הרופאים עכשיו, תרפאו את הנפש שלנו. עומדת בחורה, ילדה, שכל כולה, אם יום שהיא לא יוצאת עם ילדי חולי תסמונת דאון, או ילדים אחרים, צמחים כאלו, מסכנים, מטיילת איתם, מנהלת ארגון שלם, היא כל כולה חסד, והיא שואלת אותי ביידיש, תתי, בוז וזן, אבא, מה יהיה איתי? כל אחד שיכול שייקח משהו, אם זה בגדים, אם זה שבת קלה, אם זה חתונה, אני חייב, חייב להתקדם, אני לא יכול לבייש בת ישראל. הרי בחתונות הקודמות מכרתי פמוטים, מכרתי מה שהיה לי. ושתבינו, אני עובר המון, עין שמאל לא רעה, אוזן שמאל לא שומעת, מחושים ברגליים חלשים מאוד, המון 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 בעיות. אני רק רוצה לצלם לכם לשנייה את המקרר, ובזה אני אסיים. איך שנראה מוצאי שבת מקרר אצלי בבית. גם זה הרי לא יאומן כי יסופר. אצלי בבית כבר חודשים, חודשים, חודשים שלא נכנס עוף הביתה, רק כנפיים. אני מחנות אחת לוקח גרונות חינם ועצמות שאני עושה בזה מרק, ורק כנפיים. אני לא בוכה, לא מתלונן, אבל דבר אחד, תהיו עכשיו רופאים שלי, תרפאו את הנפש השבורה, תנגבו את הדמעות מהעיניים שלי ושל אשתי. תעזרו לי להתארגן, אני רוצה להגיד לה, אסתי היקרה, הנה, את בת מלך ותהיי בת מלך. ובעזרת השם, בזכות כל החסד, יעזור השם. שגם אתם תיוושעו בתשועת עולמים, ושישמעו רק טוב וחסד יעשה עמכם כל הימים, אמן.
you know, in uh, today's shiur, we're uh, not going to cover a lot of ground as far as uh, many uh, sentences within the within the uh, uh, the letter itself. We're really going to cover about one or two sentences, and the reason why is because the issue itself is enormous. I mean, uh, you could really make a an entire series of uh, endless amount of lectures just about this topic, and as you uh, perhaps see uh, from the title, think about death always. That's in essence the topic of today. Now, of course, no one wants to talk about death. You know, it's a, it's a morbid topic. It's a depressing topic, uh, or at least that's where it's perceived. It's perceived as if it's morbid. It's perceived as if it's uh, not a good thing. Why don't you talk about you know something nicer? Cheer us up. People are already dealing with troubles. But if you look at the words of the sages, they thought differently. Uh, and as we learned from the Chazonish just a couple of days ago about who is a great person, and we, uh, you know, and he defines it as the Gdolei Ado, the the Talmidei Chachamim, the people that are angels among men. You know, when they're choosing to talk about this topic uh, as often as can possibly be, where you pretty much see countless sages, countless Chachamim throughout all of the generations spend a uh, you know an exorbitant amount of time covering this particular topic of dealing with death, preparing for it. Uh, it's in the Gemara, it's in Rishonim, Achonim, it's in recent uh, 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 sages. And you see this particular topic as uh, really as, as common as, uh, as really uh, uh, fear of Hashem, as common as uh, really any other issue out there that's, uh, you know, a Shabbat, put it that way. Why? Because if a person, if a person thinks about death, they can fix their life. But if a person thinks that they're going to live forever, they have no reason to fix their life. Uh, it, it's, it's actually one of the biggest reasons why these uh, so-called speakers and, uh, 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 and they call themselves rabbis sometimes, are uh, when they tell people that there is no punishment, and when they tell people that everyone's going to go to heaven and everything's going to be okay, or uh, if there is any punishment, it's something minuscule, it's, it's really more of like a uh, cleansing, like a laundry, but in reality, everything's going to be okay. That's why the sages, if you look at Sefer Hasidim, if you look at the uh, uh, other Chachamim that have discussed this topic, uh, when in the issues of Erev Rav, if the Zohar Kadosh, they dis- put those people at the top of the list of enemies of Am Yisrael. You know, because that particular trait, that particular uh, strategy or, 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 uh, or simply type of speech where you are minimizing the magnitude of the punishment, you're minimizing the magnitude of of uh, of the warning that Hashem is giving us, that is a character trait of Amalek. It's a character trait of Amalek, uh, where Amalek's primary goal is to cool off Am Yisrael from their servitude of Hashem. And this is not a new thing. This has been always there, uh, and it will always be there until Mashiach Tzitkenu will come and simply destroy all of those people. Now, to talk about death doesn't necessarily require... Uh, the details of what happens after death, as far as Geinom, Kafakela, Chibuta uh, Kever, all of these different topics that uh, are indeed very hard to uh, speak and hear. But rather, simply a logical conversation about death uh, is necessary for every single person to have in their mind on a regular basis, on a regular basis, in order to live their life in accordance to what Hashem uh, uh, said. Because if a person is constantly thinking about death, as often as David Melech did, as often as uh, uh, he writes it in Tehilim, as often as all of the sages uh, talked about it, they simply will be will force themselves to live a righteous life in a natural way. You know, they'll actually want to live a righteous life. But those people that have the mentality, like the wicked people at the time of Isaiah, eat and drink today because tomorrow will die, meaning just do whatever you want, uh, enjoy, uh, enjoy life while you can type of mentality, those are what the uh, uh, Torah calls as the wicked people, as the wicked people that want to live and fulfill every desire under the sun without a care in the world. 
Unfortunately, sometimes people are led to think this way by people that are supposed to lead them in the right direction. And this is uh, part of what uh, we'll discuss today to a certain extent. Now, the Galmi Vilna, uh, of course, you know, determined by the sages around him and entitled by the sages around him as the Gaon, uh, meaning that they perceived him as if he was, at the very least, one of the Gaonim that lived you know, 500 years before him. Uh, And in some cases, some say that he was like the Tanaim, uh, which lived a thousand years or more than a thousand years before he lived. That's how much of a unique, extraordinary Chacham the Gaomi Vilna was. And hence the reason why it's his letter that we're reviewing and not uh, some Einstein's letter or some uh, Isaac Newton's letter. Even though they were smart in their own professions and expertise, they were literally the dust, uh, the dust under the feet of the genius of the Gaomi Vilna. Now the Gaomi Vilna here says, So here the the Gaomi Vilna, after telling us the importance of uh, making sure that the children uh, get the right chinuch, the girls get the right chinuch, uh, you know, the, uh, the boys get the right chinuch, modesty is critical, the girls need to know it, they, you know, they need to live it, they need to want it, uh, the boys need to learn Torah, they need to protect their breed, they need to make sure that they have, uh, uh, you know, they're honoring their parents. After he discusses all of this, he now focuses on the next point. And he says, always focus your attention on these matters, meaning everything that was discussed until this point, because all else is futile. For man can salvage nothing from his labor to take with him. As it says in Kohelet chapter 5, verse 14, uh, and uh, it says, except two garments, which is he's referring to the burial shrouds. Uh, Rav Steinemann, Allah Shalom, says that at the time of the Gaume Vilna, they used to have the custom of using two uh, uh, two shrouds uh, covering the dead, uh, uh, unlike uh, what it is today. Uh, some say it was one for the body, one for the head. But uh, the point is, is that the Gomi Vilna is saying, this, everything that I've said so far, this is the main. This is the most fundamental uh, teaching that I can leave off with you and the kids. If you do everything I just said, then you will go in the right path, not just in this world, but eternally. If you don't, everything else is simply going to go to waste. Everything else that you do, all the other good things that you'll do, all the other uh, you know, acts of kindness and mitzvot and so on, if you're not, if you don't have the fundamentals right, everything else will go to the garbage. Why? Why should you think about this most importantly? He says, because a person that lives in this world trying to you know acquire as many things as possible and acquire many things and money and and, and things of that nature is simply a you know forgetting the fact that they can't take any of this stuff with them they simply can't take any of this stuff with them and there's a very famous story of a uh, uh of a, a rich and righteous person that uh you know before he died He left his uh, children a uh, last wishes, and uh, after he passed away, uh, they opened the envelope. When they opened the envelope, he says, My dear children, I only have one wish. One wish before you go to the lawyer and, uh, you know, see what, how I divided up the inheritance, which child gets what, and so on and so forth. Please just fulfill this one last wish that I have. And what's this wish? I want to be buried with my favorite Red Sox. That's it. That's what I want to be buried with. Now, this may sound silly to you and I, but sometimes a person has something favorite, something that's sentimental, that they say that in in their own mind, they want to even be buried with it. They want to be buried with it. Rav Shach, Allah Shalom, 
was a Ish Kodesh, Ish Torah. They, they say that if Rav Shach didn't go in a, a, against you, you were simply a nobody. Why? Because if you were anybody, if you were anybody, the Rav Shach had uh, some type of issue to discuss with you. And many times he would go and expose it publicly against some of the people that he you know, determined were enemies of the Torah. It was a very, very big uh, fight between the Rav Shach and the Lubavitcher Rebbe. Uh, so much so that there was a, uh, some fools uh, that were the Hasidim of, uh, you know, of, of, uh, of, of Chabad that uh, thought that they can throw their hat into the argument and uh, publicize all types of insults on the Rav Shach and so on and so forth. And when he died, he, despite being one of the Gedolei Ado, these fools uh publicized their celebration of his death now of course Rav Shach was a tzaddik kadosh one of the Gdoleado of the generation and was somebody that dedicated his entire life for for the Torah for Am Yisrael for servitude of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. but he had of course many people that sent him letters of uh, of uh, of threats of all types of things and one time one of his Hasidim found that uh, there's a huge sack of letters and he opens up the uh uh the uh, this sack and he sees some of the letters and he sees this horrible language in it cursing and insults and threats and so on and he asks the rav for the rav why are you keeping all of this he says no this is my favorite this sack of letters is full of letters of people threatening me of people insulting me of people saying all types of things and this is my favorite so much so that I want to be buried with them. I want to be buried with these letters. So the Talmud, of course, understands that the rabbi doesn't say anything uh, to get attention. doesn't say anything for no reason. He's, he's really serious about this. Why do you want to be buried with this, Kvod Rav? He says, because this I can take with me with Tishamayim, and this will be my evidence to the Bet Din of Heaven that no money in the world, no threat in the world, nothing in the world can scare me other than HaKadosh Baruch Hu. The only thing I followed is what HaKadosh Baruch Hu said. Nothing else that I was scared of, nothing else will motivate me to do anything other than what HaKadosh Baruch Hu said. Popular, not popular, they threaten, threaten my life, don't threaten my life, take the money, this the, doesn't make a difference. Only thing I'm afraid of is what HaKadosh Baruch Hu said and that's how I live my life. So, this is how the Gdolim, the Gdolim, you know, many people that read their, uh, the bios of Rav Ovadi Yosef, Rav Shach, uh, and any of the Gdolim are surprised when you first started read the bios of some of these sages that we had, they're surprised at how many wars they had to fight during their life. I mean, literally, it's a, uh, uh, it's no, uh, it's no, it shouldn't be a surprise to us because look at how many wars uh, Moshe Rabbeinu had to fight, despite being the uh, the Mashiach of all Mashiachs. Uh, he uh, he had uh, his own people that he saved go against them. Korach, the Tan Aviram, the uh, the the Miraglim, and so on and so forth. Countless people went against Moshe Rabbeinu, calling him a womanizer and a, a thief and all adulterer and all types of horrible things. And that's Moshe Rabbeinu. So a, uh, no different with David Melech. David the Melech had endless enemies, endless enemies, literally never f- more than 15 minutes of sleep throughout of his life because of all the uh, agony that he had to deal with, some of it from his own family, his own uh, uh, son tried to kill him. Uh, so, Absalom. And the, the key is, is that this is not a new thing. When you're fighting for the truth, expect the other side to fight back. And they will fight tooth and nail. They will fight with... Uh, awful uh, tactics they will fight in a uh, uh, atrocious ways but you remain strong remain honest and remain true to the Torah itself so here this particular uh, rich person that uh, you know obviously was a uh, uh, well aware of the Torah well aware of uh, you know and lived his life with Torah but still also well aware of what money does and he says you know before i give my children all of the inheritance which surely despite the uh the death and the agony and the and the pain of, of having somebody's father die you know a uh a, the reality is it's not uh so uncommon to uh to hear the uh the children of a rich person not exactly so uh upset 
about the death of their parent because they're so focused on the inheritance. So here in this case, this particular wealthy person left a last wish letter for his uh, children to fulfill, asking them to bury him with his Red Sox. So, of course, they want to fulfill their dear father's last wish. They go to the Chavra Kadisha, the, uh, the Jewish uh, uh, organization that takes care of the burial of the Jewish people around the world for, uh, you know, centuries already. And uh, they say, they ask him, listen, our father is such and such. He uh, just died. We have a uh, request. This is who he is. This is the evidence. He wrote this letter. This is what he wants to uh, fulfill. Chadisha looks at the letter. He said, listen, before we read it, we're just letting you know. Anything that requires a change, a change from what our norm is, we have to get permission from the Rav. We don't perform any change for anybody in burying any, uh, uh, the uh, Jewish people unless the Rav approves it. So if there's a change here in this letter, I'm just letting you know. So the guy, the, the, the boys are getting a little worried. Why? Because there is a change. Being buried with, with socks on. You know, as a Jew, you don't get buried with, with clothes on. You have the, the, they're wrapped with a, uh, one of the, uh, with something, and then that's it. It's not, there's no, uh, uh, there's no socks, there's no pants. You're not buried with your, uh, with your iPhone. Maybe you'll uh, play some, uh, uh, some uh, Tetris. You know, this is a uh, serious and uh, holy event. This is part of the, uh, there's uh, many uh, alachas that are pertaining to burying people. And uh, unfortunately, people that are far away from Judaism, uh, unfortunately, sometimes they end up uh, doing what uh, many of the goyim do, which is to burn the bodies, which is a desecration of the body. It's completely forbidden for a Jew uh, to uh, to uh, have their body burned or have their body donated to science or have somebody else's body burned. It's completely, completely uh, uh, forbidden in Judaism. It's a desecration of the body. And that soul will uh, see no end to the suffering that it gets. Uh, and, but unfortunately, this, uh, this does happen. Uh, you know, and it's uh, usually part of the punishment that a person gets for uh, living a life that's uh, you know, against the Torah, where they are the only people that are left behind to bury them uh, are uh, people that uh, simply want to go and do whatever is the fastest way to get rid of the body. And without, uh, without too, much, uh, too much involvement, and uh, unfortunately, burying the body is a, uh, you know, takes a little bit more than, uh, than uh, to burn it. Uh, but like I said, it's forbidden for Jews. Now, in regards to, uh, um, to this person, he uh, had a request that he wants to be buried with red socks on. So, the Chevra Kadisha looks at this letter. They said, we're sorry, we have to go ask the rabbi. They go to the Rav. The Rav looks at the letter and within a, a matter of seconds says, absolutely not. Absolutely not. So these guys hear this and oh, let's go to a different, a different location. We'll go to a different location, different nothing doesn't matter where they go doesn't matter which rav they ask no one is willing to bury the father with the socks on and they will not budge the guys are offering a bunch of money it doesn't make a difference they're asked they're offering even more money they're offering all types of deals nothing is standing on its uh, two legs with full force, we are not making a change to the uh, tradition. You want to bury him? You want us to bury him in a Jewish cemetery? It must be like a Jew. It cannot be with socks on or anything or a hat or anything else. So of course, the kids realize that they have nothing to do. There's no, there's really no uh, no chance that they could fulfill this, and they allow the Chavakadisha to do the last honors of burying the body in a respectable way without the socks on, and they start sitting Shiva. And during the Shiva, they're, of course, they're sad that their father left the world, but they're even sadder about the fact that they weren't even able to fulfill their, their you know, his last wish. And if they, and they say, listen, he's given us so much, 
were probably going to get uh, a lot each he worked so hard we couldn't even give him this one thing that he asked for us it's so terrible and as the shiva is a uh, week is about to end suddenly a uh, lawyer walks into the uh, the house and uh gets the attention of all of the uh, sons it says here i have a uh, last wish from your father that uh he wanted me to give you on this day after his death and they open the letter and they see their father's handwriting saying my dear sons so now you realize that you didn't you didn't succeed in burying me with my socks i'm not surprised and the reason i still asked you is because i wanted to remind you before you start finding out about what i left each and every single one of you remember when you leave this world you can't even take your socks with you no matter who you are and how much money you have even socks you're not allowed to take with you so whatever i gave each and every single one of you remember don't fight because you can't take any anything that i gave you and anything that you earn and anything that you make from this world you can't take anything with you only thing you could take is the torah and the mitzvot that you fulfill and the good deeds that you fulfill that's all you can take socks you can't even take so obviously don't fight over money and this was a very well thought out musar lesson that's a once in a lifetime type of lesson and uh it uh, serves a lot of purpose for what really the the gaomi vilna is trying to teach us here because many times people want to change they want to modernize judaism they want to change judaism even a little bit even a little bit in the book of deuteronomy in uh, next week's parasha parashat shoftim there is a uh, verse that perhaps from the surface looks a little extreme if you will in the beginning of the parasha in uh, chapter 16 verse 22 akadosh baruch Hu gives us a commandment and you shall not erect for yourself a pillar which Hashem your God hates. Here, Akadosh Baruch Hu, in one of the few times in the entire Torah, tells us not only not to do something, but specifically tells us, don't do this because I hate it you would think oh he must hate murder he must hate rape pedophilia all types of other things but no he doesn't actually say he hates all those things of course it's forbidden and those that violate the this prohibition will get punished severely but here in this particular thing he's telling us simply these pillars i hate them i hate them hashem says so the sifri comes and says that in the days of our forefathers the people loved pillars they loved to have pillars all types of a uh, big stones that they would have and they liked them so much they were attached to them so much that they started putting the sacrifices to the idols on these pillars so much so that a kadosh Baruch Hu says because so much atrocity has happened with the use of these pillars to serve foreign gods i hate them i hate them so much that you're not allowed to use them even to serve me even to serve a kadosh Baruch Hu. you're not allowed to do it with the pillar only thing that you are allowed to have is to have the altar at the Beit Mikdash. Other than that, no such thing. You're not allowed to have any type of pillar, any uh, any type of uh, thing that's going to uh, uh, be a way to serve a Kadosh Baruch Hu. A Kadosh Baruch Hu says, "I hate it." Now, the uh, Gemara in Masechet Avodah Zarah says 
that uh, from here we also learn that those that uh, communities that elect their uh, their judges their dayanim based on popularity vote based on things that are not exactly a uh, the right reasons to put a dayan in place and if they allow such dayanim to rule over the communities they should know that in the eyes of a kadosh it's like they put a pillar of idolatry to rule the jewish community meaning that communities that have wicked judges wicked dayanim unfortunately i've met a few those communities in shemaim are being judged as if they have a idol worshiper ruling over the community itself and the Gemara says in other places that the Ben David, the Gemara Masechet Sanhedrin, the Ben David, the Mashiach, will not come until all of these wicked, wicked Dayanim are removed from the world. Why? Because these are some of the people that unfortunately destroy the communities. I could tell you I, a, a story that I know firsthand, where literally you had a, a group of Dayanim, group of Dayanim, rule on a uh, case a uh, financial case between two Jews and the Dayanim decided to rule in favor of one of the parties not because of any evidence not because of any evidence that they brought to the table but rather because of the Lashonara that one of the friends of the Dayanim said to him about the other party oh this person he's a such and such he does such and such and even though there was no evidence of any of this garbage that's how they rule the case which is as obnoxious as it gets obviously shows the wickedness of the dayanim in that particular case but of course there are many dayanim that are tamidei chachamim that are tzadikim that are kodesh kodeshim and a person needs to know who he's dealing with who he's dealing with because there are unfortunately some wicked people that call themselves dayanim that have the degree if you will that have the position of power if you will and if the community knows that these people are corrupt it's the job of the community to remove these people from power to you know and, and literally kick them out of the community not allow anybody to go there and obviously replace them with someone that's a real serious talmid chacham that has yirash now unfortunately the uh the the world of uh torah is uh, at times upside down and some people don't know what's the right thing and what's the wrong thing enough to uh, to fight for the truth or not but one of the things that we do know is that in practically every community in practically every community needless to say on the internet and in the uh, community of the internet there are countless people that are whether they call themselves speakers or rabbis or whatever it is that are constantly preaching change they're constantly preaching a progression in their own language from the masoret now at the time of the khatam sofer there were the maskilim the enlightenment movement the uh, the reformers the reform movement and so on and these reformers they wanted to also make a progression now of course they didn't come with uh what they have today to the jewish community they didn't tell them listen we want to give uh, uh, a bar mitzvah to a dog like they do today they didn't uh, come to the community tell them listen we're going to have a non-jewish female as the rabbi of the jewish community they didn't do that at the time of the uh of the Khatam sofil they came with smaller changes smaller changes what kind of change they say he said we want to change from the tradition of having the bima was next to the Arona kodesh throughout all of the history we want to move the bima to the middle of the synagogue we feel like it's nicer over there the chazan is going to be closer to everybody everybody can hear his voice better that's what we want in some of the communities that's what they did they moved the bima from being where it was near the Arona kodesh to the middle of the synagogue the khatam sofer saw this and pasked 
Alacha, at the time, which said, any synagogue that moved their bima to the middle of the shul, it is forbidden to pray in such a place. Why? Chadash asu mina Torah. Nu is forbidden according to the Torah. Now this is, it's not a biblical mitzvah to have the bima next to the Aron HaKodesh. But the Chatam Sofer says it has nothing to do with this being a biblical mitzvah, a rabbinical mitzvah, or a mitzvah at all. This has to do with renewing the tradition, changing the tradition. Because this specific change, it's not just any change. This change was motivated by the Enlightenment movement, was motivated by the heretics from the Reform. And because this is their signature that they are uh, pushing, that is what makes it forbidden. It's not necessarily that the bima itself moving from one place to the other is, is, is forbidden, but because it is a sign from them, that's what makes it forbidden. The same went with the Maril Diskin. The Maril Diskin, he was in Eretz Israel, and at the time, the uh, reformers were trying to penetrate Judaism in a different way by speaking in a more sophisticated language, according to them which is English. The Maril Diskin, Paskind. It's forbidden for any Jew to teach English in the yeshivot or for anyone to learn English. Forbidden. Now, is it forbidden to learn English? According to the Torah, no. Moshe Rabbeinu himself wrote the Torah in 70 different languages as a specific commandment from a Kadosh Baruch Hu. But because at that specific time, that was a symbolic move of the reform it became forbidden in that community now of course today because these specific things of moving the bima to the middle of the synagogue or speaking or learning english is no longer connected to the reform there are plenty of chachamim that uh, speak english and many other languages and uh, that's why According to Allah today, there's no problem of having the bima in the middle. There's no problem of speaking or, or, or teaching English or other languages. If that's going to help you uh, serve Hashem, there's definitely no problem. If that's going to help you uh, uh, provide food for your family, no problem. But the point is, is that because it was symbolic for the reform movement, that's what made it forbidden. Why? Because they're trying to change. And they're not coming to you with a big change of what eventually happened all the way today of giving bar mitzvahs to dogs and having non-Jews as, the, uh, as, as members of the community and even the leaders of the community. No, they uh, started with small changes. Today, uh, today, the symbolic thing for the reformers is the feminism movement. Feminist women that consider themselves orthodox jews have to run away from feminism as far as they possibly can why feminism is forbidden according to the torah it's 100 percent forbidden to the extent that akadosh baruch Hu hates it why does he hate it why does he hate the reformers that wanted to move the uh, bima into the uh, into the middle. Why does he hate those that were teaching English? Why does he hate all of those people? For the same reason as why he hated the pillars. There was so much damage that came from that initial change that it became hated by a kadosh baruch Hu. So the feminism in general is antithetical to the Torah, and the symbolic things that the feminism movement does in the world of jewelry today is saying that the woman should start learning Gemara, the woman should start putting on tefillin as if she's as righteous as Michal, the wife, one of the wives of David Melech, they used to put on tefillin. Some say even that the daughters of Rashi put on tefillin. So saying, see, we have history uh, of women, righteous women putting on tefillin. So why can't we put on tefillin as women today? 
There are women that learned Gemara in the past. Bruya, the wife of uh, of uh, Rabbi Meir Baranes, not only learned Gemara, she was a Tamidah Chachama. She was one of the Gedolei Ado. Uh, so we have people, we have women that have done this. Why? What's the problem of doing it today? What's the problem of a woman being a Sandak in a Brit Milah? All of these things are forbidden. Every single one of them is halachically forbidden. Forbidden for women to do it. Why? Because they're all symbolic. They're symbolic of the reform movement. Especially since the women that put on tefillin are typically women that don't even know the, uh, the, the laws of modesty. They put on tefillin while wearing a tank top. You know, they, uh, they put on uh, tefillin and a talit as if they're uh, some uh, male rabbi, but they're walking around with a miniskirt. These people have no concept of what Hashem is, needless to say, is Torah and the tefillin and all of the mitzvot. But they're doing it specifically to cause a change. They want to change. They want to show as if they are in the same uh, level as the men. As if the men are somehow chauvinists and they're, they're against women. This is complete falsehood. Complete falsehood. You want to be a righteous woman? Don't learn Gemara. Go learn Musal. Go learn the laws that pertain to you. You want to fulfill extra mitzvot? Don't spend extra 10, 20, 30 minutes, an hour a day putting on tefillin. No. Go do some chesed. Go make some food for somebody that doesn't have anything. Go help somebody in the hospital. Go help somebody that's dying. Go help somebody uh, learn something. Perhaps be a free tutor in your community. Go do something useful. You thinking that you're going to become more righteous because you're learning Kabbalah or you're learning Gemara or you're putting on tefillin, that actually is what makes you wicked in the eyes of HaKadosh Baruch Why? Because what you're doing is symbolic of the reformers that are enemies of Hashem. Because they always want to change what the tradition is, what the laws are, and they're, they're not looking for one huge change. They're not coming to the community and looking for one big change. They just, they're just like the Satan that puts out a nail in your house and says, that's, that's all I want. That's all I want. And before you know it, it takes over the entire house. And that's Chadash, Asumin Torah, Chatam Sofer says, which is a verse in the Tanakh, by the way. Chadash, Asumin Torah. Nu is forbidden according to the Torah. We don't change your traditions. This is one of the main things that a person needs to learn as a Jew. When we have a tradition of something, we don't just uh, uh, go against it just because you don't understand it or perhaps it doesn't fit in the view of society today like some fool say listen a woman doesn't need to cover her hair today uh even if she's married because today you know everybody walks around with no head covering so therefore it's no longer abnormal for a woman to cover her hair uh, to not cover her hair it's complete nonsense so if everybody was walking around naked that means that it'll be allowed by the torah obviously this complete foolishness by people that are too blind to see too blind to see but unfortunately most of this blindness doesn't actually come from the secular community most of this blindness comes from people that pretend to be religious this is why HaKadosh Baruch Hu rebukes us rebukes us in the book of Isaiah where he says O deaf ones, listen, and blind ones, gaze to see, who is blind but my servant, and deaf as my messenger whom I sent, who is blind like the perfected man, blind like the servant of Hashem. This is the book of Isaiah, chapter 42, verse 18 and 19 and uh, 20. Now, who is he talking about? Who is Isaiah rebuking in the name of HaKadosh Baruch Hu that's blind and deaf? Who is he talking to? Is he talking to people that are desecrating Shabbat? Is he talking to people that are idol worshippers? Is he talking about people that are uh, Christian missionaries? Who is he talking about? He's talking about the Frum community. He's talking about the Frum community. 
he's telling the deaf ones can't listen obviously if he's deaf he can't listen the blind ones they can't see obviously if he's blind he can't see so why is the double mention here Chachamim teach us the double mentioning here is because he's blind because he doesn't want to see the truth he's deaf because he doesn't want to listen to the truth he's blind only when it's convenient for him to be blind when it's the truth is on a screen and he doesn't want to watch it but if it's an immodest woman somehow he's always able to see that he's deaf because he chooses not to hear he chooses not to listen when it's lashon when it's all types of filth he's always there to hear what you have to spill from your heart but if it has to do with musar if it has to do with the truth somehow he's always unavailable somehow he's always busy somehow she uh she doesn't like this particular speaker he's too harsh but how come the uh the other people that were talking much worse are not harsh no because they tell you what you want to hear they tell you you're allowed to sin so unfortunately today Rabotai, many times you have people that are looking to change change the different jewish communities that you have all over the world and it's not surprising to see the deterioration of the jewish communities in different places that were much stronger just a decade ago 20 years ago 30 years ago judaism was very very different in many places than it is today you know the uh the the way that modern orthodoxy is today is very similar to how conservative used to be 70 years ago but conservative today is practically almost identical to reform or at least what reform was let's say 10 years ago modern orthodoxy is more similar to conservative why because 50 years ago modern orthodoxy there was no such thing as people driving to shul on shabbat today in practically every modern orthodox shul that i know of here in florida and in other places there is an active parking lot in so many words on shabbat of people driving in and driving out but yet still considering themselves orthodox uh, uh jews in the previous generation everyone understood that modesty is not a suggestion today you could walk into a uh, synagogue and feel like you are on a beach why it's as if many of the communities have thrown out modesty into the garbage now don't just think that these are the only two communities that we're picking on reality is you'll find problems in every community whether it's the Haredi community the Hasidic community everywhere everywhere you have there's garbage in every street there's no there's no exception every house has a garbage pail every street has a garbage truck collecting every every week there's, there, there's garbage in every place the key is to understand where does this all stem from where does this all start it all start with people ignoring the message from heaven intentionally simply being lethargic about the truth lethargic about somebody implementing a change from the masoret from the tradition and allowing it to happen and in fact in many cases pushing for it to happen pushing for it to happen a so-called rabbi starting a talmud uh, uh, program for girls this is pushing the envelope for change a uh, a, a different rabbi having a poker game as a charity event this is pushing the envelope for change casino night at the synagogue this is pushing the envelope for change all of these different types of changes are completely forbidden according to the Torah this is how reform started how conservative started and unfortunately how modern orthodoxy uh, has started to behave over these uh, uh, recent years and it's continuing to deteriorate before you know it the assimilation in these communities will be so high there wouldn't be any Jews left and that's just simply the reality so now what does this all have to do 
with, uh, with uh, death, if a person thought about the fact that one day they're going to have to pay the bill for all of these forbidden changes, for all of these sins, according to the Torah and its sages, if a person understood that one day they're going to have to show up at the Bet Din of Heaven and pay for each and every single one of these crimes, a heavy punishment that the whole world suffering put together cannot even quantify what a punishment is for a single sin. The magnitude that HaKadosh Baruch Hu has is not comprehensible to a regular person. It's just not. People think, oh, Hashem loves us, Hashem loves us, and you're right. He loves you while you're in this world. Once you leave this world, as Rabbi Israel Misalan said, and many other Chachamim said the same thing, it's judgment. It's not love. There's no love at the Beddin of Shemaim. It's judgment. Are you righteous? Are you wicked? The Rambam says that to be righteous, you have to have more uh, uh, mitzvot than averot. Not in quantity, but rather in quality. You'll have more good deeds than bad deeds. He doesn't say that you won't suffer for the bad deeds. He says uh, himself in uh, Ilchot Shuva that there is a genom that's forever. Obviously, this genom is not just for people that are Hitlers. This genom is for anyone that's sinning. There's different parts of genom. But the point being is that people don't have a concept of what this punishment is because they have speakers and leaders and rabbis that speak to them simply pacifying them simply minimizing the magnitude of the judgment and emphasizing that hashem loves everybody unconditionally so much so that you have nothing to worry about because you gave tzedakah because you are a nice person according to yourself and to a few other people you are trying your best according to yourself and a few other people even though you're trying your best is desecrating shabbat and hashem's name and everything else you are simply good enough that hashem has to expect accept you as you are this is a chilul hashem this is a desecration of the torah this is a destruction of the torah and a person that teaches such things there's no end to the genome that they're going to go into the Gemara in Maseret Rosh Hashanah says in page 17a, the Mashiach will come, the world will end, but the Genom of such people will never end. People that are distorting the Torah, Megale Panim Bat Torah, this is a worst possible crime that a person can make. Now, unfortunately, it's not just those people that are misteaching people, it's also the people that follow it, the people that listen to them. Why? Because you have a brain, you have a neshama, you have a heart, you have a lot of different tools that Hashem gave you, and a lot of different events that Hashem puts you into, and a lot of different signs that Hashem sent your way throughout your life to show you the truth, to give you an opportunity to explore the truth. Which means that if somebody lived their life in this world and ended up still a heretic, still an idolater, still a Mechalel Shabbat. It's not a happenstance. It's not a, oh, he didn't know he's a victim. In, in practically all cases, these are people that were given an endless amount of opportunities from Hashem to think about Judgment Day, to think about the fact that there's going to be a punishment for desecrating Hashem's Torah. But they chose not to because they had something else on their agenda they had something else that they decided is much more important now the chachamim dealt with the battle against the yetzerah in many many different ways sometimes through stories sometimes through musar teachings sometimes through all types of different activities that they would do arav galinsky alav shalom he uh, went to the Shiva in Novardok. Over there, they, this is the, one of the foundations of modern-day Musar, came from Novardok. 
And Rav Galinsky said that uh, when he would learn in the Shishiva in Novardok, the Stipe Lagaon was there, many, many Chachamim were there. Literally, you would see different Bachurim create, you know, choose statements within the Torah, within the uh, uh, sayings of Chazal to repeat over and over and over again, meditate over over and over again until it became part of them to remind him to constantly do tshuva to remind him that this world is temporary and you spending your time chasing money chasing women chasing materialism chasing everything is simply a waste it's simply a destruction of your own life and your own eternity and he and everybody else in that uh yeshiva would do everything possible to perfect themselves to destroy their yetzara and one time Rav Galinsky says that uh, he wanted to destroy his Yetzara once and for all. How do I destroy the Yetzara? By showing him I'm not afraid of him, I'm not afraid of anything but Hashem. He decided to go to the cemetery at night, to the Jewish cemetery at night, and dip into the mikveh of the cemetery at night, the very same mikveh that they wash the dead bodies. And that's what he wanted to do to get rid of any fear of anything to get rid of any yetzara he says i'm going to take you to school yetzara he decides he's going to go at night scary as it is cemetery and to dip into the mikveh of the dead and that's what he did he goes in the middle of the night it's freezing cold snow and he gets to the cemetery which in itself is scary needless to say at night for those of you that unfortunately have made so many sins that you've developed a klipa uh, with a thickness of a uh, iceberg that don't want to believe that there is the beatings of the grave there's chibuta kever and so on i recommend for you to go to the cemetery during the first three days of when somebody died go at night and just sit down next to the grave for a few hours you'll see and you'll hear what happens in the grave but for those of you that are smart enough to just simply believe what the sages said there is beatings in the grave especially during the first uh three days there is a a lot of horrible things that happen to a person after they die especially if they're a sinner but nonetheless to go to a cemetery is never a good thing unless you're going to a cemetery of tzaddikim here Rav Galinsky as a young bachul goes to the cemetery goes see everything is dark there isn't the uh, same things that you have today lighting everywhere and so on so you can't see barely can see right or left and what's uh you know uh two feet in front of you he sees a pool of water and he decides to go in the freezing cold water to destroy his yetzara jumps into the water and as soon as he jumps in immediately he feels the legs of a body he is so shocked that he passes out he passes out a few moments later gets his consciousness back and runs out without looking right without looking left just simply runs away once he gets to the yeshiva he sees one of the other bachurim also disheveled he says to them what's wrong with you he says what's wrong with you he says well I was just at the mikveh in the cemetery trying to destroy my yetzara and he realizes he was doing the same exact thing and he says at that moment i realized that i have much more tshuva that i need to do not for the issues of killing the yetzara for fear but rather the yetzara of arrogance that i have he says about himself this tzaddik why arrogance why did i think 
that I'm the only clever tzaddik in this yeshiva that's going to have the idea to go and dip into the mikveh of the cemetery in order to kill the Yitzhara. Why wouldn't I think that all of the two, three hundred bachurim that are in the yeshiva could have the very same idea or a better one? I have to do tshuva for having so much pride. Here you see the mindset of a righteous Jew that understands where they stand has an ambition but nonetheless is constantly thinking is living their life with constant thought process having death in mind not death in a sense that you're miserable and you you think oh what's the point of life but death in mind in the sense that every action that i do has to have death in mind meaning if i die tomorrow will this be something that i'm proud of or ashamed of this is one of the things that the chachamim constantly do constantly do the gaon arav shach lived till 107 years old but during his later years at one point he uh fell ill and felt like he was gonna die this was years before he died but there was one time that he fell ill and he felt like he was going to die. He took one of his gemarot, went down on the floor, lay down with his gemara, and waited to die. A short while later, one of the Talmidim came into his office and saw that the Rav is laying on the floor with a gemara in his hands. He says, Kvadarav, what are you doing? He says, I think I'm going to die. So he picks up the Rav and he says, Okay, Kvadarav, uh, you're not going to die, everything's going to be okay. But one question I have for you is, What's with the Gemara? Why do you have the Gemara in your hand and you're on the floor? He says, Because this is the way that I lived my life learning the Torah of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. I want my death to be remembered the same way. In Shemaim, what are they going to do? They're going to show you your whole life, but at some point, they're going to show you, this is how you ended. This is how you ended. I want that picture of my end to be with my Gemara on the floor. That's how I want to look. Many times you have people, literally, live a life that's so shameful that if they would die at that moment it would be the most embarrassing thing in the world there's actually a real story that happened where there was a uh, a few stories i'll tell you actually i heard from other fine where it was uh, one guy uh comes over to a uh, another guy in the bit knesset and he uh, whispers in his ear after he whispers in his ear the guy that was whispered to the receiver starts screaming his lungs out screaming 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 heart attack dies shemish moviatzil no one understood what just happened so they asked the guy what did you tell him that got him to go crazy he says to him I just told him that he's sitting in my chair and he got upset this is a rebuke as a side note this is a rebuke for all of these superheroes made up tzaddikim that feel that the words of the sages that tell you that you should sit in the same place and pray to HaKadosh Baruch Hu is a ma'ala which it is but if you sitting in the same place is ever going to cause another Jew to get embarrassed because you're telling him to get out of your chair, even if you're saying it politely, even if you bought the chair, you see another Jew in there sitting, you go somewhere else. Yeah, but it's my chair. There is no such thing as your chair. Synagogue is a Kadosh Bahu. There is no such thing as it's your chair. You want a chair? Come early. Somebody sitting in a chair? Even if he's a guest, 
even if he's not somebody you like, you go somewhere else. To go and embarrass someone and tell him to leave that chair, I promise you it's not a mitzvah. It's not a mitzvah at all. In this particular case, this person died. Now imagine, this person goes up to Shemaim, they're at the bed dean of heaven, and they're going to be out, oh, what brings you here? Oh, yeah, I died. Yeah, no, we know you died, but tell us, tell us a little bit about your uh, death. Oh, I, uh, somebody told me to move out of the chair, so I lost my mind. Oh, that's, 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 that's the culmination of your life. You lived 50 years just to die because you were told to move out of a chair. Of course, the guy that told you to move out of the chair, he's wrong. But you got that angry off of somebody telling you to move out of the chair? Are you willing to die for it? Why well, didn't think I was going to die? Well, didn't the Torah tell you not to get angry? Didn't the Torah in Gemara Masechet Shabbat said that anyone that expresses anger is like an idol worshiper? Didn't the Torah warn you of such things? Look at the picture you have of you screaming and yelling. They'll show you on a screen. They'll show you on a screen. 4K screen in Shemaim. 500K. Show you on a screen in Shemaim. Look at your life in the last moments. You died this way. What a shameful way to die. In another case, there was a uh, guy that was looking to park, but somebody else pulled in before him. He gets out of the car, starts screaming at the other guy. The other guy doesn't want to be a pushover. He says, I got here first. He says, yeah, but I signaled. He said, but I got here first, and I singled, and he pushes him. He says, don't push me, and he pushes him again. The other guy goes into the car, grabs a gun, boom, kills him. Kills him on the spot, moves his car, puts his car in, parks his car somewhere else, and goes into a supermarket and starts shopping. As if there's no God that's watching, as if no one really uh, acknowledged the fact that you just committed murder. This happened. Now imagine, this guy is going to go up to Shemaim. The murderer is going to get his punishment. There's no question about it. But the guy that got murdered, he's going to go up to Shemaim first, obviously. The other guy is still in jail to this day. Now that's Israel. It's a real story. He's still in jail to this day. Same thing happened with two guys fighting over a key. There was one key for the, uh, for the basement of the building. And they were fighting over a key. One guy pushed the other. Ended up killing him. Now those people that are murderers are in jail to this day. They're not coming out anytime soon. But the other guys that are dead also have a price to pay. When they go up to Shemaim, they're going to show him. Or they did show them already. Look at your life. Look at the culmination of your life. You lived 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years just to end it over an argument of a key, over an argument of a parking lot, over an argument of a chair. Aren't you embarrassed of yourself? Didn't you ever think about death? If you would have thought of death, you would have never allowed yourself to live such an angry life. If you would have thought about death, you would have never even started the argument. If you would have thought about death, you would have realized that every difficulty that you have in your life is a test from Shamaim. Where does it say so? Alacha. It's not only a saying of the sages as a suggestion. It's an actual alacha in a Shulchan Aruch. Let's see. Shulchan Aruch says... In Ilchot Birkat Odaot Siman Resh Chaf Bet 222. In Seif Gimel, it says, Chayav Adam Levarech Alara, a person is obligated to make a blessing over the bad, Bedat Shlema, with a full Full intention. Meaning with complete acceptance of it. Just like he would make a blessing, meaning a, uh, a gratitude of Hashem. Not an actual form of blessing of Baruch Atah Hashem that, uh, that you gave me bad today. There are some times that you have to do that, like saying Baruch Dayan Ayemet, which it goes into a little later. But nonetheless, you have to accept the bad 
And bless Hashem for the bad, just like you bless Hashem for the good. Ki ara'ah le'ovdei Hashem i simchatam ve'tovatam Because the bad that happens to those that are serving HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that are serving Hashem, that's actually their happiness, that's actually for their own good. Kivan shemekabel me'ava ma shegazar alav Hashem because he accepts everything that Hashem gave him, decreed on him, with love. Nimtza shebekabalat ra'azo u ovedet Hashem shei simcha lo. So here, if he accepts this bad as uh, uh, with with happiness, this is making him happy because he is serving a kadosh baruch hu. That's chuchan aruch. Comes the mishnah brura, the chavetz chaim, and says the following: Ki beemet kol ayusurim ben beguf u ben bemamon. He says. The emet, the truth is, all of the suffering, whether in a body or with money, it is all a kaparat avonot, it's in essence paying, a payment over the sins that you've already made, in order not to have suffering in the future. What suffering in the future? Shisham ha'onesh hu arbe yoter gadol, says the Chafetz Chaim. The future, that's the life after this life. And the suffering over there is much, much bigger than the suffering of this world. Vekedeita ba Midrash. It was written in the Midrash, Yitzchak Tavai Yisurin. Ainu shehu ikir godel midat adin shel ha'atid. Vekein ze amar, gam ken David ha'melech alav ha'shalom. Samach mipachdecha besari mishpatecha yareti, vetava ba'atzmo yisurin kidei shinakem mikol vakol, velo yitzterech lifchod od. Amar lo ha'kadosh baruch hu, chayecha, davar tov ata mevakesh, uimcha ani matchil. Here the Chafetz Chaim brings a couple of sources we learned from the Midrash for this specific halacha. We have the Shulchan Aruch, but the, 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 uh, the uh, Chafetz Chaim in the Mishnah Brua says every time a person gets any type of suffering in this world, it's to his favor. Why? Because if you don't get it in this world, you're going to get it in after death. If you're a Jew that thinks about death and realizes that life only begins after this life, automatically you are accepting all of the difficulties you have in this world with happiness. And where would you learn this from? You learn this from Yitzchak. You learn this from David Melech, who Yitzchak Avinu, he says, it says, he understood the, uh, the God and Midat Adin the, the magnitude of the judgment in the future and the eternal world. And because of this, he asked for difficulties in this world. And the same thing with David Melech, the Chafetz Chaim says. Who writes in Tehilim, I'm scared, my flesh is scared from your judgment, I'm, I'm tr- uh, uh, with trepidation from your judgment, Hashem. And please, give me suffering in this world. He asked for, him st- for Hashem to give him suffering in this world, so I could be cleaned of any judgment and not have any judgment in the eternal world, says. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu responded to him, Chayecha, davar tov ata mevakesh. You're asking, you're going to get it. You're going to ask what you got, what you got. You ask for it, I'm going to give it to you. Because it's good what you're asking for. It's good what you're at. You're asking for judgment in this world. It's good what you're asking for, David. Now, of course, we're not at the level of David Melech and Yitzchak Avinu to ask Hashem for suffering, and I don't recommend it. For anyone to ask Hashem for suffering. Why? Suffering comes by itself. If you're able to accept all of the suffering you already have with 100% love of Hashem, with 100% acceptance of all suffering, you're doing fantastic. Don't ask for any extra. Why? I promise you. It comes by itself. That's just the way life is. That's the goal of this life is to overcome the suffering. It's not to watch Netflix 
It's not to buy jewelry. It's not to exchange your car every three years when the lease ends. It's not to have fancy jewelry and it's not to have the biggest house on the block. I promise you it's not for that. It's to overcome the suffering in order to clean your neshama from all sins to arrive at olam ba clean clean with nothing and the more you accept the suffering the more you accept the suffering with love the easier your transition into the next world is going to be why because you thought about death always you're always thinking about listen the suffering really sucks i don't like it i don't like pain i don't like agony I don't like losses. I don't like all of these things. I'd rather be sitting there and enjoying myself. But because I know that death will eventually come, which means the end of my session in this world, which means the beginning of eternity, I want that eternity to be good. But not just good, the best. With nothing there to stop me from an eternal goodness. So I'd rather have what I view as terrible right now rather than have it there. Why? Because the terrible now, as bad as it is, is not even an iota of the bad that it would be in the next world. Why? Because over there, there is no mercy. There is no limitations of a body. The Gemara in Masechet Brachot says that there's different types of fires. The highest fire, the highest fire that we have in this world, which is like the blue fire, is not even close to the lowest fire in the real world. It's not even close to the lowest fire. There's multiple types of fires. There's multiple types of fires. There's a fire that uh, destroys both the uh, 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 liquid and solids there's a fire that the all the biggest fire is the fire that destroys another fire that's the spirituality fire that's the fire of akadosh baruchu this rabotai doesn't have there's no limitations in the next world so when a person understands thinking about death is to my benefit why because if i think about death i could live life in accordance to what hashem says and thereby be happy with my lot whatever my lot is whether my lot is enjoyable or my lot is suffering i accept it it's one of the amazing things that i always noticed about rabbi shaf the one that is in the video earlier today with all the suffering that he has he constantly mentions how he's accepting the suffering even with tears of agony he's accepting the suffering with love to hashem now no one knows what's in a person's heart other than a kadosh Hu. but sometimes even saying it out loud helps sometimes even saying it out loud even if you don't necessarily 100 percent mean it helps deal with the suffering why the gemara says even if something starts without necessarily the full intentions or even the right intentions eventually it'll get there if you continue doing it so even if you initially have suffering that you hate you dread this suffering you dread this pain but you say baruch hashem i have pain no would you would you want pleasure instead obviously it's not you're not mental you're not asking for pain but if you already tell yourself every time you have pain you say baruch hashem you bless hashem because of the pain automatically automatically puts you on a different pedestal than everybody else why you understand the purpose even if you can't fulfill it 1000 percent and really enjoy the pain and enjoy the suffering because you know how much is truly worth still you understand that this life is simply a corridor before the eternal life it's simply a corridor this is one of the things that a person needs to constantly have in their mind constantly have in their mind but unfortunately many times people are fooled by the satan they're fooled by the satan which is there to blind them my dear friend uh, Rav Sebag is a uh, genius scientist as well as a Talmud Chacham 
he sent me one of his recent write-ups about different parts of the Torah to discuss the Yetzirah in his real name, which is uh, spelled Samech Mem Aleph and Lamed. And his just write-up, it's, uh, he says, his name, his name is symbolic of his job in essence. Now the Mesilat uh, Yesherim, the path of the judge by the Ramchal says that the Yetzara literally blinds a person's eyes. In essence, the Yetzara is full of eyes. His job is to blind us and help us sin by making us work, uh, walk in uh, spiritual blindness where uh, there, he puts all types of stumbling blocks. And he says that uh, this you can see in his role and when he's mentioned in the Torah. Now he's not mentioned in the Torah in a traditional sense like King David or Avraham Avinu and so on. He's mentioned in different uh, hints. In different hints. So in one of the places he says that there, his name appears in a unique instance uh, in one place in the Torah where there is the, uh, the first letter of each of the words spell his name only in one place in the entire Tanakh where in the book of Isaiah chapter 47 verse 17 which speaks of the astrologers and sorcerers that uh, the uh, the uh, the Jewish people were going after where witchcraft and sorcery are coming from the Sitra Acha they're coming from the forces of evil which is the domain of the Yetzirah so the verse says those which is referring to the astrologers and sorcerers those with whom you have labored your traffickers from youth each strays off to his own way there is no one to save you and the hebrew verse is ken ayulach asher yagat asher yagat ish laevro tohu en moshech so in the words your traffickers from your youth we see that uh, each person strays off to his own uh, path to his own uh, way and in those uh, those letters those words so uh, uh, in those specific four words the first letter is uh of each one of the words spells the names of the satan's real name uh, as i said uh uh mem aleph uh lamid uh sam and l so now it was uh it was the samich mem the evil inclination who enticed the people to stray after the sorcerers and now each strayed to his way so Samael he, uh, appears in the Rashi Tevod of the first letters, and because first he manifests as the evil inclination to entice people to stray after his evil advice, making it appear as if it's good, and therefore the conclusion would be that they would eventually, uh, you know, go in uh, in their own way, which is obviously not the way of the Torah. Another place that he mentions here is a. Uh, it says in the uh, verse in Genesis, chapter 20, verse 16. And to Sarah, he said, Behold, I have given a thousand pieces of silver to your brother. Behold, it is to you a covering of the eyes for all who are with you. A, uh, when you use a uh, Torah code, a seven-letter skip of the uh, the uh, from the uh, uh, words covering of the eyes, you see each seven letters end up spelling the word of the uh, Samech Mem's name. We say Samech Mem and that is not his actual name because we don't want to call to his attention. We want to learn about him so we know how to avoid him and we know that he exists. As the uh, Gemara in Masechet Sukkah, page 52b, uh, says that uh, the, uh, the evil inclination, the Yetzirah's name, is that. And uh, he has other names as well. But uh, it's, it's important for a person to know who we're dealing with here. 
and this is different he's constantly hidden within the torah just like he's hidden in a person's life uh in order to entice him to go uh, against the direction of the torah now uh Arav Sebak says here that a seven letter skip is in the secret of the seven sefirot of the tumah the uh, the forces of uh impurity and the reason it's hinted in the verse that is speaking about money that uh that sarah was uh was in essence given or her brother was given is because uh and it's also connected to uh, covering the eyes behold it's uh, you are covering of the eyes is because as the verse says in the uh, book of genesis as well that a bribe blinds even the uh the right the wise in the book of uh, i'm sorry in dvarim in the book of deuteronomy chapter 16 verse 19. for one of the primary ways that the yetzerah entices people is through the desire for money and through this lust he blinds the eyes of men and places them on incessant labor throughout their lives now here we see that the constant constant uh, uh objective of the satan is exactly in line with the false speakers that are trying to blind people from what the truth is in order for them to go in a new direction in a different direction from what the torah says and this unfortunately Rabotai, is one of the uh, uh one of the constant battles that a person has to win on a daily basis but it's not possible for them to win it if they don't even realize that they're fighting it if they don't even realize that, that it's the yetzerah that is enticing them to go in that different direction that it's the yetzerah that's enticing them to constantly go in a direction that's against the torah because sometimes the satan will come to a person in a form of a mitzvah or at least the mitzvah that they think that they uh, they're making where you'll have a uh, at times uh i can tell you from uh, experience different people that are you know either uh, uh you know they listen to the shulim or the talmidim or they're uh you know different uh, uh fans of, of 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 torah for myself for, for different rabbis and you see that these people generally mean well but at some point or another they stop following this rabbi and in fact in many cases they start disliking the rabbi and in other cases of extreme they even become enemies of the rabbi how does such a thing happen and this unfortunately happens it happens it's uh Baruch Hashem, not often but it happens why does such a thing happen the satan sees that a person is changing their life they just abandoned the world of materialism and secularism and, and anti-torah and they joined the tribe they started doing tshuva they start keeping shabbat they start learning they start doing a lot of things but one day this force of of kedusha that brought them into the torah world that got them to have a uh, a place in heaven says something they don't like says something they disagree with says that they have to uh you know do something that they don't want to do says that they don't give enough say that they don't do enough says that they're wrong about their judgment about something immediately when they get this rebuke they view because they don't want to be rebuked they feel like they're already more than enough they're right the chacham is wrong they know better he doesn't know what he's talking about automatically this makes a huge distance between them and the chacham despite all the good that the chacham has done for them despite all the help that this person has given them everything is in the garbage they've been watching and being influenced and helped by his lectures for 10 years but he one time said that such and such is wrong and that such and such is really you not that he's talking about you but he's talking about something that you're doing in essence he says you're wrong you're not supposed to rebuke people that way you're not supposed to talk to your parents that way you're not supposed to treat your kids that way you're not supposed to be in a community that way you're not supposed to do such and such in essence rebuke is directly at you no question about it and you simply reject it but you can't just reject it and move on many times what happens you say no he's wrong And if he's wrong about this ah i guess i've graduated from his teachings i need to move on to someone better 
And unfortunately, this not only shows a lack of emunat chachamim, faith in our sages, a lack of understanding what Torah is, a lack of understanding what siyatu bishmai is, the divine assistance from Hashem is, and the teachings where this rebuke was meant for you, for you to change, rather than for you to use it as a pedestal to go in the way of the Satan. They have no understanding of what the truth is. They have no understanding of how to follow the truth. They simply are following whatever is convenient for them. And unfortunately, many times these people turn into being a, uh, in, the, in the best case scenario, simply uh, go on static, they just b- go on neutral, where whatever they got to, where they were growing steadily for X amount of years, that's it. That's where they park and they start going up and down little by little from there, but they never continuing to grow like they were growing, uh, you know, over the first uh, several years due to this person that was influenced them. That's in the best case scenario. In the worst case scenario, they become 100% apikosin, heretics, enemies of the Torah. And unfortunately, more times than not, they become the latter rather than the former. They become apikosin, heretics against the Torah, enemies of the Torah, they start publicizing Lashon Ra about the person. They start saying all types of things. Why? They don't want anyone telling them what to do. They don't want anyone telling them that they're wrong. They think that they're right. And this, unfortunately, is something that shows a lack of gratitude, a lack of understanding what Torah is, a lack of understanding what Chachamim are. Simply, it's as if they've never watched a single Shiu Torah. Everything goes into the garbage. And this is unfortunate, but it is something that happens as a result of somebody not willing to think about death. That's what it's all about. They're not willing to think about what is the magnitude of my actions, because had they thought about death, they would know, wait a minute, this rabbi that helped me do tshuva, this rabbi that has helped me get married, this rabbi that has helped me such and such, this rabbi that has helped me get a share in the world to come. HaKadosh Baruch Hu sent him as a messenger to me. And now he's giving me a message that hurts, that I don't like, and I don't even agree with. Why would Hashem send it to me? To hurt me? Obviously not. Is it the Satan sending it to me? Obviously not, because if it was a Satan sending it to you, he would have sent him to you 10 years ago through this rabbi. If the rabbi helped you do tshuva, the Satan has nothing to do with him. So obviously, if you're thinking about death, you realize, wait a minute, this, this message that I don't like what I'm hearing, it's for me. Why? Because I'm wrong. Because my understanding of myself is wrong. My opinion is wrong. The Chacham is right. I have to change. That's why Hashem is sending this to me. Because I am wrong. Not the Chacham is wrong. He's the one that gave me a path to go to Olam Abba. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu has used him to give me a path to Olam Abba. HaKadosh Baruch Hu is not evil. He's not going to use the same path to get you to Olam Abba. Also to get you to gain home. There's no point in that. If he's using someone to get you to Olam Abba, to get you to heaven, surely he's going to continue using that source to get you to heaven, not to uh, uh, make you fall. If he's going to give you different tests, it's going to be through a different way. But you decided to stop listening to him, and all of a sudden your marriage is in the garbage. All of a sudden your kids can't stand you. All of a sudden you start losing money. All of a sudden you don't have as much faith in Hashem. All of a sudden you don't really like to learn to lie anymore. Need I say more that you're already ruining your life just because of your ego? But that's what happens many times. And I've witnessed this with my own eyes on a few occasions, unfortunately. Where you see somebody listening, watching, doing, everything is good. A year, two years, three years, four years. Suddenly, one day, they ask you a question. Question number one million already. A million questions they asked you, you gave them the answer, they went with it. Question one million and one, you give them an answer, they determine you are Amalek, you are Erev Rav, you are the bad guy. Why? They don't agree with you. And they decide to stop listening to your lectures, they decide to stop 
doing everything that they were doing that got them to where they are in the first place. And in fact, little by little, they become an enemy of the Torah. And you don't even realize it because it's not like you're calling your uh, students every single day and every single person that watches your video or attends your class. You have no idea what's going on. But what ends up happening is one day, somebody tells you, oh, you heard about such and such? No, what happened? Is okay? No, he, uh, he just made a video about you and uh, he hates you. Oh, really? What did I do? I don't know. What, what, what did I do? That, that he hates me. Oh, he said you guys had an argument nine months ago. And t- argument? What are you talking? I haven't heard from him in nine months, but I didn't have an argument with him. And that's what happens. And that's what happens, Rabotai. And I'm not even specifying a specific case. There are literally, this story that I'm giving you is a compilation of a bunch of different cases. So nobody thinks I'm pointing them out. The reality is this happens. You give a person a rebuke, you give a person news that he doesn't want to hear, you give a person an answer they don't like, they turn you into the enemy. Forget that you are the source of Kedusha for them. You are the source of help for them. You are the hand from, from, from heaven to get them to the right place. But instead, they use you as a excuse to fulfill every wicked desire they possibly have oh i love you my rabbi okay great so how come you don't listen to me oh because i love her yeah but she's forbidden to you she's a goya you're a jew yeah but she wants to be jewish good she can want to be jewish until she's blue in the face until she's jewish she's forbidden to you ah you don't understand me anymore rabbi i thought you knew me i already i i, I thought you knew me I thought, I thought you knew me. This is the stupidity of people. They think you're trying to hurt them. Or the best yet. No, no. He feels like he's Jewish. He feels like he's Jewish. Wait, but you're a Jewish woman. Yes, he is not Jewish. No, but he feels like he's Jewish. And I think he is. I think he is, Rabbi. You are not thinking right. Samech Mem is thinking right. He's thinking, you belong in his garbage. That's what he's thinking because you're following him. Don't follow the Samech Mem. He's just simply trying to blind you. He's simply trying to blind you. But that's unfortunately what happens constantly with people. As a result of arrogance, as a result of ego, as a result of stubbornness, as a result of addiction to sin, addiction to desires, and sometimes simply an addiction to a bad character trait such as anger. Like those people that killed people because he didn't give him a key or because he didn't give him a parking spot. This is all in the Mesilat Yesharim. The Mesilat Yesharim, Path of the Just in chapter 11. In the specifics about the virtue of cleanliness, spiritual cleanliness, the Mesilat Yesharim says that the sages said, whoever gets angry is regarded as though he engaged in idolatry. Gemara Masechet Shabbat, page 105b. He gets angry over any opposition to his will and becomes so filled with fury that he loses control emotionally and his judgment becomes muddled. This is in essence, Yetzirah didn't just come and influence him. Yetzirah is already parked in this person's brain. A person of this nature would destroy the whole world if he were given the opportunity. He is not ruled by common sense at all and he's literally bereft of reason like the wild animals referring to such a person has been said in the book of job chapter 18 verse 4 one who tears his soul apart out of anger must the world be desolate because of you comes the messilat yesharim and says he is capable of committing every sort of transgression in the torah if his anger leads him in that direction for he is bound to nothing but his anger and where it leads him he will go here we see that a person not being able to control their anger and their anger doesn't necessarily mean you start beating up people and killing up people sometimes the anger is expressed with yelling and screaming or just simply with a uh, the, the attitude that a person has no way that he's going to talk to me that way. Rabbi is going to rebuke me. Huh? Who does he think he is? I'm a chacham. I know how much gemara I know. Eh, 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 eh. You're going to gain him. Why? Because you don't want to listen to that Torah. You don't want to listen to the right things. You want to listen to your anger. 
You want to listen to your anger and you are going to put yourself in Gainom and regret it. Why? You're not thinking about death. You're thinking that Hashem is sending you the same messenger that got you to heaven to bring you to Gainom. There's nothing more foolish than that. But that's all in the Torah. The Samech Mem, his job, his job is to blind you. Not blind you from things you've never seen before. Blind you from what you're used to. Blind you from what you are normally accepting. That's what he's blinding you from. There's no point of blinding you from something you've never seen before. You don't even know it's there. You don't even know what it looks like. But rather he's blinding you from what you're familiar with. And making you see only the bad thing. This unfortunately is one of the things that happens. Now, the Mesilat Yesharim says that a person needs to make sure that he controls his anger. But don't. So that, some people can say, okay, great. So if you have to control the anger and you know that anger is terrible, then obviously uh, rebuking shouldn't be uh, good. It shouldn't be allowed, right? Opposite. Same exact chapter, just a couple of paragraphs later. Mesilat Yesharim qualifies the statement and says the following. Of course, even for the sake of fulfilling a mitzvah, our sages of blessed memory have cautioned us not to get angry. Even a rabbi with a student or a father with a son. Of course, this does not mean that they should not rebuke them. Let them rebuke them time and time again, but without anger. In order to guide them along the right path. And any anger they express should only face should only be facial rather than true anger of the heart. Meaning sometimes the way you're going to get rebuked by your father, by your rabbi, is going to sound like he's angry at you. He's yelling at you or he's talking to you in a certain tone. But if he's a real serious Tommy Kham, he's not angry at you. He wants to show you anger because he wants to, you to take what he's saying seriously. He wants you to take things seriously. But if he talks to you like, listen, everything is okay. You know, you shouldn't have raped that girl and you shouldn't have killed those people. No, no, no. It's not going to work. It's not going to work. You have to obviously tell people things based on how you, you know, to communicate. You have to talk to people based on the magnitude of the, of the crime. And if you're a passionate person, you talk in a certain way. If you are a monotone person, you talk in a certain way. But nonetheless, rebuke is 100% a Torah commandment. But if you don't know how to rebuke, keep your mouth shut. Sometimes people want to fulfill the mitzvah of rebuke, but they rebuke the wrong people. Who do they want to rebuke? They want to rebuke the rabbi. They want to rebuke the rabbi. Oh, the uh, rabbi such and such just met with the Pope. Ah, he's an idol worshiper. He's a heretic. What are you talking about? He's Gdoladol. He's the biggest rabbi in the world, you chamol, you donkey. You're calling the biggest rabbi in the world an idol worshiper because he met with the Pope? No, no one is saying become best friends with the Pope and start hugging him. But to me, with the Pope or some other idol worshiper is sometimes a necessary thing that Jewish leaders need to do in order to make peace idolizing them uh, uh uh celebrating with them uh, uh complimenting them doing all types of things like that or, or getting people to go listen to them obviously that's all forbidden but to meet with them to talk a uh, uh frankly with them in order to uh to make peace in order to uh to have peace that's simply part of the job of a uh, of a leader and you're gonna misconstrue that and say because you saw a big rabbi especially a gadol adol me with an idol worshiper that makes him an idol worshiper that's what you think of torah that's what you think of the gadolim that's you think he became a gadol because he met with a bunch of uh uh, 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 uh christian leaders or arab leaders or whatever leaders that's that you think that's what hashem decides he decided to put that and that together a person needs to understand you have to know who to rebuke you have to know who to rebuke and you have to know that your rebuke is 100 percent kosher according to the torah not because it's your opinion and not because it's your understanding but because you have da torah backing you meaning you ask somebody that's much much wiser than you much more knowledgeable in alacha and torah than you 
and they verified this is not only you're right but it's your job to go rebuke it's your job to go say something you can't just decide to just go against anybody just because because many times what's going to happen is the etzara is going to put a wool over your eyes blind you of the truth and make you go rebuke the worst possible candidate on planet earth one of the most righteous people in a generation and you decide to call him a uh, amalek this, the amount of suffering that people bring on themselves make me question whether there's any punishment at all whether there's any punishment at all that they're paying for in the future because they're literally making the sins now that i don't think that they're they're paying for anything of the past or anything else literally it seems like people are just making a crime and hashem has enough kindness enough kindness to just make them simply suffer during their life for their life they're not fixing anything from the past but the reality is is that when a person understands that their job their job is to think think about death in such a way that they're utilizing this thought in order to dictate how to act today I'm going to think about death before I take any action. If I'm going to do this, how that how is that going to look? If I were to show up at the bed dean of heaven tomorrow. If I were to do that, how is that going to look? If I were to show up at the bed dean of heaven tomorrow. And a person that before they take any action, they view this action based on what happens if this is how it all ends. Am I okay with that? Am I going to be proud of this action? This picture being the headline in the uh, bed dean of heaven tomorrow? This is what I wanted to, to finish off with? If a person truly thinks that way, their life will completely change. Why? Simply, most of the things that a person does, they're simply not going to do them. Unless they know 100%, or at least as close as possible to 100%. That what they're about to do is not only allowed, but even recommended by the Torah. This Rabotai is in essence what we wanted to cover a little bit today. Because it's important for us to know that the Yetzirah is there to fool us. The Yetzirah is there to fool us. That the Yetzirah is there to constantly make us think that there is a better way. There is a more pleasant way. There is a way that uh, you're going to uh, enjoy more than the way of Torah. But this is all lie. It's all lie, no different than the lie of the Satan when we first started in the Torah as the serpent. What did the serpent do? Serpent told that Adam Rishon, he told Chava that if you eat from the fruit of knowledge, from the, the, uh, from the uh, fruit, of, um, uh, fruit of knowledge, you're going to be like God. You're going to live forever and so on and so forth. This is obviously a lie. So, Rabbi Zusha, Rabbi Zusha Minapoli, one of the uh, Talmidim of the Magidim Mezrich, who was the Talmid Muvak of the Baal Shem Tov, the, Magid, the uh, Rabbi Zusha Minapoli says, when uh, one of his students asked him, how come you didn't stop Adam Arishon from sinning. How come you didn't stop Adam Arishon from sinning? Now the average person says, what do you mean, how, did he st- how come he didn't stop? How, how could Rabbi Zusha stop Adam Arishon? He's, he wasn't born for a few thousand years later. So the, in the mystical teachings, we learn that Adam Arishon had all of the neshamot, all of the neshamot in him. So in essence, every one of us was in Adam Arishon. So the student asked Rabbi Zusha, you are in Adam Rishon. You are a big tzaddik. You have a lot of spiritual strength. You are celebrating suffering. You don't see anything bad as bad. You see this good. So how come you didn't stop Adam Rishon when you were in him? Rabbi Zusha says to them, not only did I not stop Adam Rishon from eating, I wanted him to eat. Student says, what? You wanted the devil Rishon to eat? Yeah, I wanted him to eat. Why did Rabbi Zusha want him to eat? 
Maybe that's what you're asking. It's Rabbi Zusha wanted him to eat because he wanted Adam Arishon and Chavad to learn that they could eat and they will still suffer. Why? Because they listen to a heretic. They listen to this Nachash. The Nachash says, look, if you eat, you're going to be like God. So I want them to eat and see, not only you're going to eat, but you're not going to be God like God anyway. And you're going to suffer for it. And that is a lesson you need to know that you're never going to win by going against the Shem. You're never going to win by going against the Shem. And that's the Musa of Rabbi Zusha taught his students. I wanted them to sin. Not because I want them to go against the Shem. I want them to show us to this day that going against the Shem doesn't pay. Going against the Shem doesn't pay. A person today perhaps that didn't, didn't get to such teachings yet simply could teach, could learn about something like this in a different way. Simply think. Everything that you do in this world, eventually you have to pay for. You get something from the store, eventually you have to pay for it. You do uh, perform a certain crime, eventually you have to pay for it. Whether it's against the government, against your marriage, against your job, against, eventually everything comes out. Needless to say, in Shemaim, everybody has to pay. If a person thinks about that day before they make any action, automatically their life changes for the better. And anyone that tells you otherwise is simply a messenger of the very same Samich Mem that is trying to blind you, fool you, and steer you in a direction against the Shem, just like he did to Adam Arishon. Baruch Adonai Leolam, Amen Amen. אני מברך את הרבנים, הרב ירון ראובן, הרב אפרים כחלון, ראשי ארגון בעזרת השם, שערכו בפעליון, שעלו מעלה מעלה, יהיה להם ברכה והצלחה, ראש ברוך הוא ימלא בלשונות ליבם, לטובה ולברכה, שבכל אשר יפנו, ישכילו ויצליחו, יזכו עוד לעשות כאלה וכאלה, הגדילו תורה לאדירה, אמן ואמן. בזמן שם רשת בכל הארץ. הוא היהודי הזה, הוא היה מיליונר, סגר את כל הביזנס, אמר אני משקיע פה בעולמה של תורה, בפלורידה. פלורידה, איפה זה פלורידה? אמריקה. כן, ליד. אנחנו שם עכשיו הולכים להקים קהילה ספרדית גדולה. קהילה ספרדית גדולה.